Yeah, Apple. So it's uh, February and we are still moving along with Food Mageddon here. Got um, stitching together the last three videos. <laughs> Where are you going? Stitching together the last three videos. Um, apple harvest and then making mm -hmm. applesauce and dehydrated apples as well as making apple juice and apple cider. So we're going to stitch all those three videos together here. Play for a snack? Come here. Come. We have a nice snack. And we're still doing well with all of our apple stores here. We've got uh, applesauce that's still uh, still doing well. We got a lot of apple apple rings. Yeah, yeah. We got a lot of apple rings. It's one of the favorite snacks. We have to hide these from him, or he just stands there asking for apples all day. Um, and we even have uh, fresh apples still stored in the basement. These are. Uh, Forest winters, and they don't look that great on the outside with all these spots, but they're actually perfectly, uh, perfectly fine inside. We have some that we have to make into pies and other things, but some that still perfectly good. So, in February, I picked these four or five months ago. So, real happy with their storage. Anyway, um, enjoy the videos uh, this week. Next week, I have one big video about butchering chickens. We raised chickens and we only eat meat that we've uh, raised and butchered ourselves. So next week's videos will be on that. And I'm really excited to tell you about our new um, project that we have coming out, Low Tech R&D, which is where we're going to test um, some non-industrial and pre-industrial technologies against industrial technologies um, and also in their own right just to kind of come up with ideas and strategies that we can use as fossil fuels become less abundant, um, ways that we can be more self-sufficient in a scientifically oriented way, right? So we can run these trials and uh, figure out the pros and cons of different things um, so you don't have to. So, so make sure you subscribe to our channel to make sure you're hearing about the low-tech R&D as that comes about. One other thing that's really neat uh, that's kind of happened since the loss of fossil fuels is people are revitalizing previously important uh, parts of the landscape that are now important again. So this behind me is about a hundred apple trees. This is a, an abandoned apple orchard. It hasn't been used really for production in years. As you can see, weeds have grown up. These trees here are covered in grape leaves, uh, grape vines that are choking them out. Uh, really this is a... Um, what used to be a vitally important part of the farmstead, and this is on one of the older farms in the area, uh, but it's fallen out of favor. Why would you pick all your own apples when they're so cheap at the grocery store? Well, they're not anymore. So now uh, we're coming back to using these things. And because this has been abandoned, they haven't been sprayed, they haven't used any petrochemicals on them in a long time. So I'm really excited to have access to this space, uh, but it's gonna take a little TLC to uh, get it usable again. So that's what I'm starting to do now. some breathing room by killing the, uh, the grapevines. Who knows, maybe something will sprout next year. Fingers crossed. All right, well, I'm a little pooped from uh, scything down all this grass, cleaning up from under these trees to give them a fighting chance for next year. Uh, once these grapevines die, I've cut them off. 
Uh, I'll be pulling them all down probably next spring when I prune. These all need to be pruned and brought down to their old form. So there's a lot of work here in the spring, but for now, um, some of them are ripe. So I'm gonna be picking apples and these are gonna be made into applesauce. So a few weeks ago, I picked about three bushels of apples to store for the winter. And these are Spartan apples, which were designed to be stored for the winter, as well as winter forest apples, or forest winter, I can never remember, uh, which are supposed to store quite a long time. And so, uh, what I'm doing now is I'm taking them out of the baskets that I brought them in, in and putting them into... Um, into bags in smaller containers. And I'm gonna have bushel, half bushel baskets here shortly once I make them. Uh, but for right now, I'm putting them in, in plastic bags because there's a reason that you buy apples in plastic bags in the grocery store. It helps keep the moisture in. Um, if I wouldn't, weren't to do this, these would become wrinkled. And they'd be okay to eat, but they'd be better to eat in pies or something like that. Um, but if I put them in this plastic with you know, not tied too tight at the top um, so that they can breathe a little bit. Uh, they'll increase the humidity within their bags. They should be stored at 80 to 90 percent humidity anyway. And this will help keep the humidity up. Um, and then I'll put them in the coldest part of the basement that isn't where the potatoes are. I have two cold spots in my basement. One over here where the, um, where the well is, and then one over there where the stairs coming into the basement are. Um, and I have the potatoes in one, I'll put the apples in another. And the reason is, apples let off ethylene gas. And ethylene gas is used to ripen fruit. Basically, uh, the apple trees let off eth ethylene gas to say, hey everybody, ripen right now. So that they ripen together. Uh, tomatoes do it, uh, bananas do it. It's that ripe fruit smell that you have. That's ethylene gas. Um, and so, by keeping the, tomato, the potatoes and the apples apart, um, the apples won't cause the potatoes to sprout. Uh, other, because otherwise, they like the same conditions. Um, apples and potatoes both like to be stored just above freezing, so 30, 35 degrees or so. And then they like to be humid, 90 plus percent, which is a difficult combination, um, and that's why I'm having to put these in plastic bags, is to keep that humidity up. It also gives me a chance to go through and find some with spots, so I found, found these as I've been going here. Um, I should go through these every month at a minimum, every two weeks would be ideal, um, just to find um, apples with spots because one bad apple can spoil the bunch as they say. And we'll see how long these keep. I've seen instances online where these um, Spartan apples last into the spring. I don't know if I'll be that lucky. Now I have three bags. I'll just lightly close the top. I want them to breathe, but not that much. And now this goes into cold storage. Well, that's how we harvested our apple. Now let's have a look at what we do with all those apples we harvested. Even Sally, who loved everything about Linus, had something to say about his blanket. It's time to process apples into applesauce. Uh, this is one of the first things we're doing with apples. Um, I like to have a mix of apples, so I've got some yellow, I've got some red, um, some tart, some, some sweet. And so what I'm going to do now is move them through from uh, picked state into applesauce. And the way I do that is I weigh out, um, I'm going to weigh out about 20, 
23, 24 pounds. And then I'm gonna quarter them. I'm not gonna peel them or core them, I'm just gonna toss them right in the pot with a little uh, water. And then I'm gonna cook them down. And as they cook down, they break down. And once they're broken down, then I'm gonna run them through a food mill. And the food mill just takes out the cores and the peels, spits them out, I feed all that to the chickens, they love it. Um, and then all the applesauce uh, gets put back in the pot. I might add a little honey, we'll see how sweet it is. If it's, if it's palatable alone, I won't add any honey. Um, and then I'll put it into seven quart jars. Okay, now comes the real test. Come here. Our local taste tester will give us a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Let's see. What's the verdict? Mm. More? More? Okay. Mm. It's good. Oh. More? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. This is the last one. Want a little more? You're done. Okay. Kind ma'am. Nope. No more. That's it. Thank you. Thank you for your services. And then a little tablespoon or a little teaspoon of, of lemon on top. And then we can them and it's good to go. Uh, it's real easy, uh, real quick. And we'll get to save a lot of these apples for the winter. It's hot out. It's about 90 degrees out. In here, at the top it's only 100, but down here it's got to be 130, 140 degrees. So what's happening is the black mesh in there heats up and pushes air upwards uh, as it heats, right, through convection. So it pulls colder air in underneath, heats it up, and then it gets to the top and runs all the way up into this box. And then um, it runs through all these racks holding about a, well it was a pound of apples each. Most of that's water weight, probably three quarters of it. And so what I'm doing now is I'm just going through and having a check. I find a, a thicker piece, still got a bit of juice in it. So I'm gonna let it go a little longer. And I just rotate through every hour or so. Make sure I rotate these screens, check on them, maybe turn them over. Not really necessary for apples. Um, they dry pretty uniformly. Whether or not I turn them over, tomatoes is more important. And this is probably how I put up half of our apples. Maybe not half, but quite a lot of them. Uh, not half counting cider. It's now later in the afternoon. The sun has gone behind the trees, so we're not going to get any more power out of this. Almost done. I'm going to have to pop them out again tomorrow. But they're pretty close. Maybe another hour would have done it. but. Ran out of time. I have 10 pounds of apples in here. It does five in a day for sure yesterday, but just couldn't do 10. That was too much for the, the sun we had today. They are pretty good. I should mention, you shouldn't eat too many apples, dehydrated apples, on an empty stomach and without a lot of water. Last year I was actually hospitalized because I ate about a quart of dried apples, which is about, I don't know, four or five pounds of raw apples. Um, so they rehydrated in my stomach and blocked up my intestinal tract. And I, was, <laughs> I had to be hospitalized. So don't eat too many of them on an empty stomach when you're dehydrated, which is exactly what I did, which was exactly wrong. Make sure you only treat them as a snack and uh, make sure you're drinking lots of water. So there's that. I still love these things. Linus would not give up his blanket, but somebody had other plans. Snoopy! Snoopy! 
screen minus. And now for my favorite part, making cider. Linus chased Snoopy everywhere, but Snoopy made a daring escape. It's time to make apple cider. So uh, I am running apples through my grinder, uh, which is a oak drum with little teeth on it that run apples through a smaller and smaller uh, gap. And I have to push them through because this isn't perfectly designed. This is something I'm going to be rebuilding next year. But for this year, it's functioning, so I'm not going to stop it. Um, this is run, it could be run by bicycle, but it's actually being run by an electric motor right now just for ease and quickness of getting it done. Um, and so I'm putting through uh, about a bushel of apples at a time, a little under a bushel of apples, um, to fill up a five gallon bucket of pumice. Pumice is ground apples. Um, and then I'm going to take that inside. or shredded apple into this empty bottomed, uh, it's kind of like a bucket, but it's got open sides. So at the bottom, I've got this piece of wood with cut out. So the, any trapped sap on the, on the top side of this can drain out. So that's kind of like a drainage board and different pieces of fabric that kind of hold all the pumice in from, from squishing out of the slats, um, each separated by a couple of different uh, pieces of wood to help distribute the pressure a little better. Uh, if you didn't have those, just the top would get pressed and the bottom would still stay pretty soggy. This allows the pressure to be distributed better. Um, and then that will all run out uh, into a collection bucket. Um, and then I will pasteurize it and make apple juice. And I will also um, kick in some yeast to a large carboy uh, to make some hard cider for later. So, so here we go. get a lot of juice out just for my body weight. So I have to get this top cap which distributes all the pressure low enough to go under this little bell shaped foot on my press. And I just built this um, thanks to a friend of mine in Madison who had built this in the 19, was it 30 years ago in a, in a shop class um, and just never used it. So I mounted it uh, to this and uh, and put a handle on it and now through the wonder of screws <laughs> and physics etc etc I can exert quite a lot of pressure down on here and I have about a gallon out now I expect another gallon and a half if not two gallons out of this five gallons of pumice so about half of this volume is liquid not a huge rush. And 
then I get my two and a half gallons. So I got a gallon here, a gallon here, and a half gallon here. And I put them in pots with water. And then this water will be brought up to um, 75 degrees Celsius, about 170 degrees Fahrenheit. Once the internal temperature of this liquid reaches um, 170 or 75, um, I start a timer for 20 minutes. It uh, pasteurizes for that time. At the end of the 20 minutes, I clean the lid, put it back on, and they're sealed. And then they sit um, and cool down, and uh, they should be, should be shelf, sta shelf stable for a half year to a year. Today we're continuing the cider making, and here I've got my press. I've got a press full of apples, three different cheeses. They're called cheeses when you make a bundle of apples and press them. And then in here I've already pressed uh, one bucket full. Um, I've got about three gallons out of that. And so this is a six gallon carboy. So I'm about to pitch my yeast. And this is just an active dry wine yeast. And luckily I had some still on hand, but next year I don't know what quite what I'm gonna do because um, I'm not going to be able to order more yeast, right? So I might have to wash and save some of this yeast. Might also try and save some of it as brewer's yeast. We'll see how that goes. But so, you know, there's different ways to pitch this. I'm just pitching it directly and right before I do a press. And then all that yeast will get incorporated as, the, as everything drips through. I'm also going to add, I mean, while I've got it, um, yeast nutrient. Because cider doesn't have quite everything that yeast needs to be happy, so I add a, tis, a teaspoon of yeast nutrient per gallon. One, two, three. I have a little helper here. Four, five. And this is food grade urea. And if you know anything about uh, urine, uh, urea comes from urine. So I could, in theory, make my own. Uh, next year, we'll, mm, <laughs> we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Um, so now, I'm going to uh, run the press and uh, get some more juice in here, yeah. And he is worse than a wasp uh, because he's got hands and he can move these things around. So I have to keep him at bay while I press this. Uh-uh. He is very interested in all the apple juice. Yesterday we pressed gallons and gallons of cider or of uh, unfiltered apple juice that I pasteurized and saved in bottles. And now I'm working on the hard cider. He's still very interested. What kid doesn't love gallons and gallons of apple juice? Chickens. Give our chickens diabetes with all the sh sugar. Diabetic chickens. So one problem I was talking about is that I don't have uh, access to more yeast. And so if I needed to, I could harvest yeast. And this is washed yeast. And so essentially um, what I'm able to do is at the bottom of my fermentation tank, um, a lot of the pectin and the yeast will settle out to the bottom and create what are called leaves. It's sediment, it just sits there. And um, in the bottom, uh, above it, there will be an active zone of yeast. And so what happens is, uh, when I have one of these carboys full and I'm ready to decant it and um, let it settle out, I can pull off all the top stuff and leave that bottom inch. And then when I draw that bottom inch out, uh, leaving as much sediment behind as I can, then I can um, pour some distilled water in there, shake it around, um, in this case I'm using reverse osmosis water because I don't have distilled water. And then this uh, could be poured, you know, a third of this could have been poured into each of the carboys and that would have brought active yeast uh, into the um, into the, the new cider to promote fermentation. Um, but because I still have some uh, good purchase yeast, I'm using that. But once I run out, I'll be switching to washed yeast. Yes. Yes, you are very chatty. All right, now I'm down in the basement and it's January and I've got a whole bunch of different um, casks here with my different ciders. So 
here's a cider from that you just saw being pressed and here's another cider over here is uh, grape wine that I made in a previous video um, and here are some other ciders. So these are all ciders that are just kind of sitting here waiting to be um, moved into secondary fermentation. So basically they fermented in these containers and now I'm going to take them out and put just the cider and leave all these lees or the or the remaining the remaining yeast and leave that out. Um, and then uh, up here you can see a variety of bottles. We have mead and cider and other things uh, from previous years. So um, after they've sat for a while, then we'll be putting them into these um, these empty bottles, and then they'll just age. Generally, my mead uh, has to age for at least nine months. My cider depends on the cider. Some ciders drinkable in six months, and some needs a year and a half. So it really depends. Um, but yeah, uh, looking pretty good going into the winter with lots of cider for drinking, which is kind of nice. I thought it was time to do a little bit of an update because it is midwinter now. Um, and you know, this was completely full of, of jars um, going into the summer or going into the winter. We're still doing pretty well. We have plenty of pickles. Um, we have quite a bit of honey. We're starting to get down on our maple syrup. Um, our jams are doing okay. And we're about halfway through our tomatoes and it's January. So um, we're going to do okay going into the spring. Um, eventually, once we start running out of tomatoes, uh, our soups will be less exciting. Uh, but we do have lots of potatoes, so let's go look at those. So over here in the hurricane door that comes down to our basement, we have lots of potatoes in boxes, we are in um, milk crates. We have one, two, three, four milk crates left of uh, potatoes, not to mention all of our carrots um, that you saw me putting in sand, um, kohlrabi, turnips. Um, we're doing real well on the, the root vegetable crops. And that's not to mention that we have lots of uh, squash uh, still remaining. We probably have a dozen or so of these uh, Long Island cheese squash. These are my favorite. They, they store really long. This will be good well into March, April. And then here in these crates we've got apples. And you know, I, I picked this apple in September. And yeah, it's got some spots on it, but it's totally edible. Uh, great for pies, all those sorts of things. Um, and then down here we have sweet potatoes um, and more apples. So we're doing pretty well. Um, not to mention I have a dozen quarts of apple sauce still. I barely even touched that. So that's, um, and then grain wise, I see one, we probably have about four bushels of grain left. Um, I originally made nine bushels of grain. So we're, you know, we're a little, about halfway through our grain supply. Um, and that will be replenished in July. So we're doing okay. And finally over here we have our store-bought stuff. This is the things that we can't replenish. We've still got, let's see, each of those is three pounds of salt. We've still got 18 pounds of salt. We've got a couple quarts of olive oil. We've got a couple gallons of cooking oil. Um, olives, peas, oh, quite a lot of legumes. So like um, lentils and peas and beans. Um, and other kind of snacky things. Um, we do a little bit of store-bought pasta, bouillon, peppercorns, you know, we, we got little odds and ends. Uh, we're doing pretty well coming into February, and the spring is generally the hungry time, and so that's when we would start to imagine that we were gonna be um, having trouble. Uh, but really, we're, we're sailing through. Um, we will have problems, though, in terms of cooking oil. That's gonna be our Achilles heel. We don't have a way to make cooking oil. We don't have animals to make um, dairy, to make um, butter or other types of um, oil or fat. Um, so really, oil is going to be our Achilles heel. Uh, another, thing that we're, another thing that we're missing is um, onions. We ran out of onions. My onions just didn't grow enough. Um, I didn't grow enough of them. Uh, so we've been having to uh, put cut up kohlrabi and cook that with onion powder uh, before we do a soup instead of onions, and that works okay. Gives us some onion flavor, but it's not the same. So I'm looking forward to having onions, and it's one of the first things I've started in the garden already. Here at the end of January, I already have um, onions growing. Luckily for Lida, someone would always want his blanket. The end. And uh, we are approaching the end of Food Mageddon. Once we get the rest of our videos out, we're going to be summarizing a lot of what we found out, the calories we created, the calories we burned, um, the work we put into this, and our assessment of how we would actually fare. 
for you, yeah, without, uh, without fossil fuels. Stay tuned for that, but we will have a few more videos coming out, uh, so never fear, we have a couple more food Foodmageddon's coming out. Uh, but in the meantime, you can watch our low-tech R&D videos, which will start coming out shortly, um, as well as some other videos on plastering our greenhouse and things like that. Next week, like I said, we have a video on chicken butchery, and we've got a couple more coming down the, the pike here. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Uh, thanks for watching, and uh, take care of yourselves.